Crosby versus Ovechkin, Yankees, Red Sox, Madrid, Barcelona, Celtics, Lakers, the Leafs versus the first round, legendary rivalries which are unforgettable and will forever stand the test of time. Rivalries which brought out the best in one another, rage, animosity, a drive to be and stay the best. In WWE, a timeless rivalry depends on a lot. What were the circumstances like? Was the story enjoyable? Was it memorable? Did it live up to the hype? Were the matches enjoyable? We've seen a ton of great rivalries in the WWE, but the greatest slow burn story, the story that from point A to point B in the Ruthless Aggression era has to be the best, is that of Batista and Triple H. The legend legendary thumbs down Triple H making Batista into a superstar and the unforgettable segments in between. When I tell you this story was legendary, it was flat out godly. It all began in 2003 where Triple H was riding high as the world heavyweight champion. He wanted to build a group reminiscent of the Four Horsemen. His vision involved Ric Flair who was lost and just kind of sick of things at this point. A young upstart by the name of Randy Orton who was destined for success and the most bodyguard looking dude you'll ever see in the WWE. And that was Batista. At a later age than most, he went from a life of crime to a bouncer to a pro wrestler and he had a ton of upside to him. Now it was all about putting things together. Ric Flair scouted him out and started accompanying him to the ring for his matches and here he'd just tear through everyone. Fast forward after multiple injuries got in the group's way, Evolution captured all the gold at Armageddon 03. In a very short time, they became the hottest act on Monday nights. And while all of them had separate stories, they were the best when they were together. Fast forward to the summer of 04. Randy Orton was kicked out of the group the night after SummerSlam, and he was pegged to be the breakout star. 24 years old, naturally gifted, third generation blue chipper, the company wanted to strap the rocket to him immediately. He just wasn't ready for it though. He had some work to do on screen and an attitude to fix behind it. So now it was the three amigos, Ric Flair, Triple H, and Batista. By Unforgiven 04, the Randy Orton World Championship experiment was over and the championship was back around Triple H's waist. With just a few months until 2005, our story begins. It was November of 2004 and Batista had just lost to Randy Orton. Later in the night, Triple H tells him that he's got to have a talk with Edge and Snitsky. He leaves the world title behind, Batista picks it up, looks at the title and then just looks off into the distance to signal that it's coming but not yet. And our slow burner had the flame ignited. At Survivor Series, Batista was eliminated by Chris Jericho in the Team Orton vs Team Triple H match. After that, Triple H offered Maven a spot in Evolution and Batista went to Triple H and he was just like, what are you doing man? Batista questioned this saying that he was thinking about this and Triple H is like, you thinking? I thought I smelled smoke. The next week, the game was getting pissed at Batista for not having his back against Maven in the main event, and things were looking like they were about to come to a head out of nowhere. Triple H said that he put Evolution together so he didn't have to jump through hoops every single week, and he made a bet with Batista saying 100 bucks says that you lose your next match too. All the while Ric Flair is trying to get everyone to relax, Batista decided to take on this bet. He went out and left Chris Jericho laying like he owed him money. He told Triple H that he walked out of the ring and Jericho is being carried out of it and Batista in storyline was showing aggression but Triple H told him to win not to show aggression so he asked for his hundred dollars and that gave us the line that Batista had a million dollar body and a 10 cent brain that he wasn't the smartest of the bunch keep this line in mind for the rest of the video so all right this is happening Batista is done with evolution he says screw you to Triple H and Triple H is like maybe I need to find someone to replace you you guys remember that one episode of Raw where Triple H and Batista had like five segments in one night over the course of it Ric Flair goes to Batista telling him that Triple H was his paycheck telling him that when Triple H was done with the company this was Batista's industry and that he should apologize. Meanwhile, Triple H was all paranoid that he had to put his world title on the line at the end of the night against Benoit. Before that match is supposed to happen, it's panic backstage because Triple H has been laid out. Guy looks like a truck ran him over and out of the commotion walks Batista. So you can kind of link the pieces together that Batista's the one who did this. Triple H is knocked out cold and the match is called off. At the end of the night, Batista comes out, calls out Triple H, and Triple H's shirt is ripped, he's a wreck, he has Flair trying to hold him back, but he makes his way down to the ring to confront Batista. They're about to come to blows face to face, and Triple H tells him that he's only got one thing to say to him. 
Well done, man. The whole thing was a plan. A plan to get out of the match with Benoit. They didn't have any problems with one another. They were just swerving everyone. But in this, the reaction to Batista was pretty good. So basically, Triple H wanted to play the long game here. They showed us something and then they took it away only to give it back to us later on. Out comes Randy Orton who is going to be the GM of Raw the next week since Team Orton won at Survivor Series. He booked a battle royal for the World Heavyweight Championship but then it got turned into a number one contenders battle royal which gave us a double finish with both Edge and Error 404 landing at the same time. Meanwhile Batista and Ric Flair are arguing because Batista could have put the group in harm's way. Ric was mad that they didn't win the battle royal and, and Batista is slowly showing signs of turning on Triple H. Rick's like, I got your back, but Batista stays quiet. He doesn't say anything. Orton put Triple H into a triple threat match against both Benoit and Edge. When we got to that match, it was another screwy finish. Edge tapped out at the same time Benoit's shoulders were pinned to the mat, so the world title was vacated. The next week, Vince McMahon comes out to address the controversy, but Triple H is like, Vince, just, just give me the title, man. This isn't really a conversation. Vince instead puts the decision on Bischoff saying that he's going to figure it out. So naturally, Triple H went insane. He's flipping out at Batista for not being mad, calling Bischoff on the phone to just hand over the title to him. All the while, it was going to be Triple H and Batista in a tag match against Jericho and Benoit. After the match ends with a DQ, Batista gets hit by a chair shot by Triple H, by accident of course. The next week, Bischoff returns and doesn't award the world title to anyone. Triple H is on the verge of tears like, please just, just make the right decision, give me the world title back. If you want to make it feel special, just give it to me. This man made it feel like the end all be all, say whatever you want. Big man Triple H was reciting the line that this was best for business all the way back in 2004. Bischoff came to the decision that with New Year's approaching, at the first ever New Year's Revolution, it was going to be a chamber match for the World Heavyweight Championship. In this match, it was going to be Edge, Chris Benoit, Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, Triple H, and Batista. So now all the questions had been answered. How the world title will be contested, where it was, what the stipulation was, and who was in the match. But now we had to see who'd enter last. And here's where the story between Triple H and Batista really started to get going. The rules were defeat your opponent and set a time. Lose to that set opponent and they're in the match, your spot is gone. Both of them had beat the clock matches and Batista's orders were simple. Don't beat the time so that Triple H has more of a chance of entering last. What does Batista go on to do? Well, he beat the time. So they're starting to get in each other's face and Triple H says that 100 bucks, I beat my guy faster than you do yours. Alright, a nice little bet again. Triple H was losing his mind on Batista because he wasn't supposed to beat the clock. End of the night, he faces Shelton and the time to beat by Batista is 3 minutes and 2 seconds. Well, Triple H won his match, but he couldn't beat the time. Batista asked Triple H to cough up the money saying, You said 100 bucks if I beat my guy faster than you. So Triple H is like, Rick, give him 100 bucks. And Batista's like, Nah, he, he didn't make the bet. You made the bet. I want your money. Triple H brought out $100 and Batista's like, yo man, just chill. I'm kidding. This was the slow divide that they were making between the two. By having Batista be quicker than Triple H, it established that he was a threat, that he could do things better than Triple H. We're a week out of the chamber match and Triple H is set to face Orton on the go home raw. He's like, I don't want Batista out there at ringside. So Batista's like, all right, I'll hang back. Unless, you know, he really starts kicking your ass out there. But we all know that's not going to happen. This story fantastically utilized backstage segments. I know a complaint of this era is the show being centered around Triple H in multiple segments. But the story they built here was just special. In retrospect, these slow seeds of dissent between Batista and Triple H and Triple H really having it get to him is a brilliant job by Brian Gewirtz and the writing team at the time. Randy Orton got the win over Triple H, but at New Year's Revolution, it was Triple H getting the last laugh as the new World Heavyweight Champion. The next night on Raw, Triple H is running everyone down saying that he's the greatest of all time, that he's the god, every single person in the arena was useless, but there was one man who was far from useless. And that man was Batista. He came out and so did Randy Orton, but he came out with some footage that he thought that the animal should see. Orton said that Triple H didn't really care about Batista and didn't have his back. Triple H didn't really want to see this footage, but Batista did. 
And lo and behold, it was exactly that. A chance for Triple H to save Batista, but Triple H didn't. So he just goes that I was in the match for 45 minutes. I was tired. I was beat down. And honestly, I love this segment. The quick zoom into Batista. Using that little nuance that would have gone unnoticed from this match to build the story, it was genius. Now Randy was putting deception into the two's mind. Batista looked pissed and Triple H was like, nah, I would have saved you. Minutes later, Batista paraded him around on his shoulders. Randy Orton was kicked out of evolution the same way, if you remember. And Randy told Batista that when the time's right, that thumbs up becomes a thumbs down. And perfectly, as you guys know, that thumbs up did eventually become a thumbs down. WrestleMania was months away and the plan was for Orton and Triple H. That dynamic, as I said, didn't work. The night after New Year's Revolution, Bischoff made it Batista versus Orton, number one contender for Triple H's title. Rick and Triple H are all paranoid that Batista is leading towards what Orton said earlier in the night with the footage. And then to end the night, Orton won the match after Triple H attempted to help Batista with a chair, but it all went wrong for poor Batista and they made us wait again. The Royal Rumble was a few weeks away and Triple H's plans were set in stone, but Batista's, his weren't. He forgave Triple H saying that yeah, accidents happen, it's okay. He then says that he has to go talk to Bischoff about the Royal Rumble. Batista had a qualifying match for it if he wanted it and Triple H was reluctant, like nah, you, you don't need to be in the Rumble, that's going to be hard for the team, Evolution needs you, it's selfish, it's self-centered, you're basically going to become the next Randy Orton, and Batista's like, yeah, uh, no one likes a selfish, self-centered egomaniac, wink wink, nudge nudge. The next week, Batista decides to take the qualifying match, and when he said it, there was a big reaction from the crowd, but Batista was making it seem like he was doing all of this for Evolution, beat La Resistance 2 on 1 to win his spot into the Rumble. When we got there, Triple H retained, and to cap off the night, it was the battle of WWE's next two top stars, John Cena and Batista. In a legendary botch, Batista won the Royal Rumble when it was restarted. Now it was all about Batista. Who is he going to choose? What title is he going to go after? Raw or SmackDown, JBL or Triple H? What started happening was Triple H secretly started playing reverse psychology with Batista, planting videos of JBL on the Titantron talking shit on Batista's name, so Triple H pretended to to care saying that he wants to know who's playing these tapes. The GMs were going back and forth over where Batista should go and this just made the Royal Rumble win feel so much more valuable. Footage kept playing of SmackDown stars like Big Show calling out Batista after his matches and during his segments. Ric Flair and Triple H were gaslighting Batista to go over the SmackDown like yeah these guys are making fun of you, they're calling you dumb, you should go for the WWE title so that we can run everything. Remember that 10 cent brain comment from earlier? Yeah, they were leaning into the fact that he's a Neanderthal, that he's going to believe whatever's in front of him. Batista goes to Bischoff and asks him to find out who's playing these clips. Later on, Evolution meets up in the back and Triple H is like, listen, I wanted to talk to you. We saw the thing with Big Show and JBL and Triple H continues to gas like Batista. Ric Flair was like, this is bigger than DX. It's bigger than the Horsemen. It's evolution. On screen, Batista was slowly buying into the idea that he was being screwed with by the SmackDown guys. Batista's like, yeah, yeah, they're screwing with me, but uh, I'm still going to think about it. And Triple H looks at him like, bro, I'm painting this as clear as you possibly can. The SmackDown guys are screwing with you. And you're still only just gonna think about it. At the end of the night, it's Triple H versus Edge for the world title. At the end stages of the match, both guys are going for a steel chair with the ref out. Batista grabs a chair and Triple H nails Edge into Batista. Just as Edge is about to hit a spear, Batista catches him with a spine buster and helps Triple H retain the world title. After the match, we get the look. With Triple H raising his title and Batista raising his hand, Batista looks up at the world title and the crowd gets it, we at home get it, and Triple H, he definitely gets it. Batista was coming for the gold. The next week, Triple H and Ric Flair are strategizing and Triple H is like, JBL, JBL's coming to fight Batista. Triple H is making it look like he's ready to stick up for Batista even though he couldn't care less. Triple H tells everyone that JBL coming to Raw is like people spitting in Evolution's face. Because in storyline, he was doing that reverse psychology thing where you try to convince someone that you're looking out for their best interest, but it's in your best interest. Rick goes to Batista and he's telling him that JBL is coming to Raw, but Batista was unfazed. He tells us next week that he's going to make the decision. He's going to finally choose who he faces at WrestleMania. 
The whole thing here was to make it look like Batista wasn't scared of JBL, but Triple H then looked at it like, damn, he's actually not scared of him because in actuality, JBL was never there. Everything was hearsay from he and Rick, and it was a red herring. After his match with Edge, a limousine appears on the Titantron, and it's apparently JBL. Flair comes rushing down. Batista says that he's going to handle it, and just as Batista gets to the parking lot, this man, JBL apparently attempts to run over Batista with a limousine, but avoids it because Triple H makes the save onto some perfectly placed cardboard, I might add. So Batista goes to SmackDown, destroys JBL's limo, goes to No Way Out after JBL's title defense, and takes out all of JBL's goons. But the next night on Raw, it was decision time. Tonight was the night. It was the contract signing. All signs point towards Batista choosing SmackDown and going for the WWE title, but Triple H was still paranoid. Near the end of the night, Ric Flair is calling Batista and Triple H is all pissed because they can't get a hold of him, saying that on his biggest night, he's nowhere to be found. And then everything comes out. Triple H tells Ric Flair that he's done more than Flair knows. He said he was the one behind the footage. He was the one who found a white limo and got those big horns put in front of it. He was the one secretly orchestrating this plan so that Batista wouldn't challenge him for the world title. And Triple H says that Batista doesn't know what's good for him. The camera slowly zooms out and right outside the door, Batista is stood there listening to the entire conversation. Now it's 41 days out of WrestleMania, two contracts, two titles, one decision up to one man. Both GMs offer their case as to why Batista should pick them and then Triple H takes Batista's side and he tells Batista to do what's best for him. Triple H had even done the thing where he's like, yeah, if you want to face me, that's that's cool. Batista holds two contracts in his hands, looks at both of them, one for the WWE title, one for the world title and he tells Triple H that he's known what he wanted to do for a very long time. He drops the raw one on the ground, holds the SmackDown one in his hand, gives a thumbs up. Symbolic because this was the thread the entire time. When they attacked Randy, when Triple H was on Batista's shoulders at New Year's Revolution. And then the expression changes. Poetically, that same thumbs up goes down. The crowd goes absolutely berserk. Batista lays out Triple H and Ric Flair. And I'll never forget how iconic this moment was. Batista bumped to Triple H through the table, signs the Raw contract, and it was official. One of the best slow burners in history was now leading to WrestleMania 21. Batista, Triple H, World Heavyweight Championship. The next week, Triple H comes out and he's pissed. He's like, I'm not afraid of Batista. Screw that guy. Calling him a child, saying that he's going to beat him within an inch of his life. Doing his formulaic promo, saying so much, but barely saying anything at all. Batista arrives to the arena and he's like, I'm going to thank Triple H for unleashing the animal. Triple H is watching Batista come into the arena and he tells Ric Flair that he has an idea. Out comes Batista, tells everyone that everything was always about Triple H and he's sick of it. Evolution has always been about Triple H and Raw has always been about him too. Said it was just like the song, it's all about the game and how you play it and last week the game got played. Saying that it was evolution, to be the man you gotta beat the man and that man was Triple H. He knew that he was gonna stay here since he won the rumble. Out came Triple H and Ric Flair, Triple H decides to send Ric Flair into the ring, he gets his ass beat and then Triple H retreats. The next week Ric Flair is gonna wrestle Batista and Flair was pissed that this match was made in the first pace. Batista gets the win and Triple H tried to hit him with a sledgehammer. Batista catches a sledgehammer and breaks it over his knee. A few weeks out of Mania and both guys pick their poison for the other. Batista chooses Benoit for Triple H since he tapped to him at last year's Mania. And Triple H chooses Kane in a lumberjack match. Batista in this match was made to look like a monster by beating all the odds. Six days out of Mania, it was time for a face-to-face -face between Batista and Triple H. And naturally, it ended with a pull-apart brawl with security guards holding them back. This felt huge. But now here we were, Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. The main event of the show, Triple H vs. Batista, World Heavyweight Championship. This was a slower encounter between the two that was more of a vicious brawl than anything else. I actually don't think it's as bad as some people make it out to be. Both men bruised and battered, slugging things out. Batista fighting through low blows and title shots, being down two on one, dodging a pedigree. 
but with one Batista bomb, it was over and a new star had been made. The beast had been unleashed and the legend of Batista was born. Over the past six months, everything they did was all worth it. One of the greatest mania stories of all time was now complete. A billion dollars worth of pyro blaring. It was a storybook ending in Hollywood, but this chapter was closed. This story wasn't over yet. Triple H came out the next night saying that Batista was great on one night, but the Batista era wasn't going to come so quick. The next week, Triple H told Batista that he was on borrowed time. The rematch was going to happen at Backlash, saying that Batista was afraid of one thing, and that wasn't him. It was his pedigree. This was the direction that they wanted to take with the story now because Triple H didn't actually hit it in the match. He vowed that by the end of the night he was going to hit him with a pedigree. He tried at the end of the night but Batista avoided it. Then in a confusing situation, Triple H told everyone that he was going to face him at MSG next week. N not him though, he was talking about JR. Remember, it was when Triple H tried to attack JR where Batista really started showing sympathy for others. The next week, Bischoff makes the match official, but with no DQs. Triple H paid off the limo company to make sure Batista couldn't get to the arena. Triple H just bullies JR at the end of the night. He's completely bloodied. King is down. Senior citizens have been assaulted everywhere, but not as bad as the apparent assault done by Batista to the limo driver. Apparently, this man jacked a limousine to make his way to the arena and this dude just looked like a badass. Beat the hell out of Triple H, left him laying to the point where JR got to pin Triple H. The next week, Batista brought out JR and honored him. Triple H came out calling everyone in London sheep shaggers. Batista was pissing off Triple H, calling JR the number one contender and replaying that same clip of Triple H eating the pin. Hey, for, for a guy everyone calls selfish, in 2005, Triple H ate so many pins. Despite everything, Batista's trolling was top tier. Triple H got the last laugh though by hitting a pedigree at the end of the night. The two had a rematch at Backlash, which was another slower paced match but quickened when Batista mounted the comeback. There was a close near fall where Triple H tried to use the title to sneak out the win, but it was again Batista standing tall. After this, an 8-man tournament was started to name a new number one contender which was called the Gold Rush Tournament. Triple H at the end of the night took on Chris Benoit, Batista came out to even the odds and he pulled back the ring rope forcing Triple H to tap to Benoit. And Triple H was just pissed because everyone was making fun of him, everyone's chanting you tapped out, the poor guy was depressed calling the tournament BS, Batista comes out, they both tell each other how much they hate each other. And then Triple H is just like, yeah, screw this, I I'm out of here, I've had enough. He left Raw and he was questioning himself, something that you didn't see much with the Triple H character because essentially, he's just the final boss of the WWE. The finals of the tournament was going to be Kane versus Edge, Edge got the win here. Batista beat Edge on Raw and retained the world title. Ric Flair helped Batista get the win because early in the night these two shook hands and it looked like these two were actually on good terms. But just as Batista was celebrating, Triple H returned. He was away for two weeks and Ric Flair's just hair hanging out with Batista. Hits a low blow and they beat Batista into a pulp. Hit Batista in the head with a sledgehammer and Triple H simply said four words, Hell in a Cell. Triple H was undefeated in that match and it was going to happen at Vengeance. Signed the contract, it was done and delivered. Now it was time for them to deliver. Triple H says that Batista just signed his own death warrant, to which Batista went, good, you're going to have to kill me to take this. Triple H pinned Batista after hitting a pedigree in a tag team match and now the question was how would this end? If I were to tell you my favorite Hell in a Cell matches, Lesnar and Taker is the first one. I think that match is criminally forgotten, but this one is a close second. The Hell in a Cell is supposed to feel like this demonic, unforgiving structure that you're supposed to go into war in, reserved for rivalries that are so vicious and violent that they can only end inside this cage. This was it man, this was the best match that these two have ever had. A bloody, unforgiving war with Batista standing tall as the world champion. Three straight pay-per-views, Triple H lost to Batista and Batista was a made man. After the war, there was a DVD exclusive of both guys meeting in the back, shaking hands and hugging and Batista simply said that it was over and that this was evolution. 
What a completely legendary story, man. From here, Batista moved to SmackDown in the 2005 draft, and these two didn't meet again for 14 years. They had tag matches against Legacy and even had an Evolution reunion to take on The Shield in 2014, but they met one final time, this time ending things once and for all, and that was in 2019 at WrestleMania 35. See, for Batista, he had returned in 2014, but the return got cut short because Daniel Bryan caught fire, and what was supposed to be the final run and a world title run at that ended with him abruptly leaving, following him originally leaving in 2010. So to get that closure on his career, he returned in 2019, after there was a tease in 2018 where Batista said that Triple H has done everything except beat him one-on-one. -on -one. So here it was one last time. It was Ric Flair's birthday celebration and everyone's waiting for Flair to come out, but instead the camera cuts to the back with a man dragging poor Ric Flair on the floor and that man was Batista. Here for the attention of Triple H, he was back and the story was quite simple. He asked Triple H to give him what he wants, giving us a legendary meme in the process. And what he wanted was to end Triple H's career at Mania. Triple H accepted this and there wasn't much of a deep-rooted story here. It was simple. It was Batista's retirement match. I will say though, their match here was better than the one at WrestleMania 21 in my opinion. No holds barred. They just went out there and they just went crazy for the best they could at their age. And with it, and with the loss, came the end of the legendary career of Batista. With it, he stated that he'd rather go broke before having another match. And yo, legendary rivalry. I don't know many stories that have taken the time out to meticulously plan out segments and hit a home run in almost all of them. If there was ever a blueprint on how to build a star, it was this one. If there's ever a rivalry worth watching back, this is definitely one of them. Yeah, the matches were a lot weaker than anticipated, but the stories and segments made up for it. It was perfect. It was iconic. That contract signing is one of the biggest moments ever. The wildest part about all this is I don't know how no one's ever made a video about this rivalry. It's just iconic. I've said that word so many times. This is the best slow burn in WWE history in my opinion. Sure, there were no wild home invasions or chucking people off of ladders onto two tables, but they did the talking in the ring. You can say whatever you want about Triple H, but he made Batista with his star power, and Batista became one of the biggest stars of all time. Two guys, one story, one word to describe it, unforgettable. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I didn't want to go too heavy on editing on this one. Sometimes I just want to lay back and talk about a storyline. As always, do take very good care of yourself. Peace.